All right, so we're live with Jerome, and uh, Jerome is a vegan whose channel was recommended on uh, Carson, a reasonable vegan's channel, as somebody to talk to. So I'm really happy to have him on. I apologize for anybody watching live for the scheduling conflict. I just entered the wrong time in my calendar, and um, Jerome was gracious enough to understand. Uh, so welcome to the stream, Jerome, and um, if you'd like to say anything, introduce yourself, please do. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad to be here. I've been vegan for three and a half years. Um, I've been mostly active in sort of the online community, um, but I've been do doing some real life activism as well. Um, yeah, glad to be here. Awesome. Well, great to have you. And I'll definitely um, ask you more about your, um, why don't we do that now, actually? Um, if you want to maybe just tell um, everyone a little bit about kind of um, what kind of like in-person outreach you've been involved in, that would be awesome to know. Yeah, as far as in-person goes, um, the biggest one is just talking with friends. Um, it's simple, but it works really well because they already have a connection with you. Um, so if you maybe say something that might be a little bit, um, make someone a little bit defensive, they'll be more open to maybe understanding. Um, but I've also done some more like street epistemology type stuff. Um, are, are you familiar with street epistemology yeah. at all? Yeah. So I've done some like street epistemology over um, at different college campuses and stuff. Um, How have you... Like Oh, sorry. I was going to ask, like, so um, street epistemology, as I understand, epistemology is the kind of theory of knowledge, like how we know what we know. Um, yeah. how, do you relate that to veganism in your in your uh, street epistemology? Like, is that like, do you, do you have a sign or something that says something or how do you kind of present that? Yeah, I take the uh, like an Anthony Magna Bosco approach um, where you just um, go to random people and strike up conversations and uh, do it like the Socratic method, right? You just ask them uh, something like, uh, would you think it ethical to eat a dog or you know, mm -hmm. something like this? And then you ask them questions, you, um, you try your darndest, because it can be hard sometimes, but you try your darndest to ask questions that keep them open and not defensive. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, I, I am a big fan of the Socratic method. Um, and I'm also a big fan actually of the dog activism. <laughs> I think like, I've, I've heard some pushback in recent times um, regarding the effectiveness of this, like from vegans, like, you know, we, we don't need to, we don't need to get so simple in our outreach, you know, where we can, there, I've heard it suggested that we can kind of like be philosophically kind of a, a level at a level where we're not bringing dogs into the picture. But I think it's, I think it's amazing because we have laws protecting dogs from, you know, being beaten or being hurt and things like that, being abused. And yet we don't, um, we, you know, we, we literally condone and sanction, um, mass slaughtering and holocausting of billions or if not trillions of other animals. So it really, I think it, it does, um, it does kind of like, um, symmetry break the whole like human and non-human thing, you know, and it kind of bypasses that whole, like born in God's image and has a soul kind of attribute, uh, attri attribution yeah. that people give to humans. Well, something I like about it is um, it, it's basically either if you're talking about Peter Singer, it's the you know, marginal cases or um, it, it's very similar to like the name, the trait mm -hmm. um, where it doesn't really matter what moral framework you hold. Like we're asking you questions based on your your view. We, we're not trying to like force our view. We're asking right. questions about your view and seeing if it's consistent. And most of the times it's not consistent. Yeah. So, yeah. I think. Yeah. Like you said, I think that I think um, it can get like. The marginal case thing that you mentioned, I think that can get very um, into sticky territory because people can just say, well, um, I'm referring to, you know, when they do the name, the trait thing, they they say, well, I'm, I'm referring to the prototypical human being or something like that. Or I'm, I'm referring to like an, uh, an 80 percent, 85 percent kind of like mean of human beings or something like that. They can say, like, I'm referring um, what I the trait that I think humans have that non-human animals don't have which makes humans worthy of moral consideration is this uh, trait of the average intelligence of a human or something like that. Um, so I, I think, I think the marginal case thing um, is kind of wrought with a little bit of um, difficulty, but I think that the dog thing just makes it, you know, it breaks that species um, symmetry breaker, you know, or the, 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 the equalizer rather as a symmetry breaker. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's hypotheticals you can do um, with the name, the trait that doesn't 
that doesn't get into those issues. But I do agree absolutely that using a dog as an example rather than a human um, tends to be better because people don't have such as big of a separation, uh, mental separation between human and animal where you they can compare a dog to a pig a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I think that it is the case that, um, you know, you can come up with different um, kind of delineations when naming a trait or you can come up with a certain trait stack or something like that, where you can kind of um, get around certain, um, I guess, uh, symmetry breakers. But at the same time, like, I don't know, so I've heard so many name the trait arguments that it's just like, at, at this point, it's kind of like one of those things where I just, I mean, I, I still use it selectively, but um, it tends to kind of like, it tends to just orient me sideways from like that goal of like, yeah, um, you know, it, it's just kind of like, but why, but why, <laughs> I mean, kind of thing. It seems like you have to like, argue for name the trait more than you have to argue for uh, the actual issue. That's, yeah. that, that's, that's, yeah, that's really, that's insightful and pretty precise, I would say. Um, so I wanted to get into some questions that I had um, written down here. And I, I see um, we have a comment from Rooted Sunshine saying dog activism really helps see, helps people see speciesism in themselves. Yeah, I saw, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Elwood Dog Meat um, and uh, yep. Natalie Fulton on her channel. She did like an Elwood Dog Meat um, demonstration. And um, somebody came up to the table and was very passionate about how wrong it was uh, that they were serving dog meat, supposedly. And then um, at the end, they were kind of coming around. It seemed like they really understood uh, and internalized um, the message that they were trying to send. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely it's entertaining. Um, I'm not sure if you saw on my channel, but um, PETA had hosted a dog barbecue. And um, so I did a little side conversation at that event. Um, I've also in the past, I've tried doing like dog milk, um, free sample giving outing <laughs> kind of stuff. The Joey um, Carbstrong type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that kind of stuff. Um, and I think like just the biggest problem that I've encountered with it, um, my girlfriend and I did a pig's milk thing recently where we had people kind of walking by and being really disgusted by the pig's milk and just not stopping, which I think that was kind of the biggest problem. Um, and the people who actually did stop and came up to the table for the pig's milk were people who wanted to try the pig's milk. So it's like, it's, it's hard to kind of like, you can't shame somebody for wanting to try, um, something from a species other than a cow. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that I, when shaming people in, in general is a good thing. I just mean like, I, it, I can't even react to it as if it's something strange because that would be speciesistic of me to be like what you want to drink pig's milk, you know, when, when people are perfectly, um, fine drinking cow's milk. And, and, and if I wouldn't be shocked that somebody would drink cow's milk, but anyway, um, so I wanted to ask you, um, uh, with regard to, um, uh, veganism and, um, species and things like that, like how would you define veganism, I guess, in your, in your own kind of approximation of the term, like, do you subscribe to the vegan society definition? Do you just subscribe to a bit simple, like, non-commodification of non-human animals? Do you include humans as part of the definition? Do you see it as just a deontological rights extension or kind of like, what's your what's your kind of framing of it? Yeah, so I'm actually talking to Reasonable Vegan on Monday about this, about the definition of veganism. Um, the The short answer is I actually, I, I don't know what the definition is. Um, I think it's very complicated, um, but I guess the long answer would be, um, I guess so typically when when we're trying to de to define something there's like two uh battles going on there's the how people use it and then how people ought to use it um so uh, typically how people use vegan veganism these days in just in the modern era it veganism tends to be um a diet where you don't eat animals or use animal products and I think most vegans would disagree with that. I think most vegans think it's more of a philosophical type, um, uh, either rights-based or suffering reduction um, issue. And that's kind of the approach that I take with it. Um, my moral framework is I'm a utilitarian, so I tend to um, focus more on suffering reduction when it comes to humans, as well as, as, well as with animals. Um, Though I'm going back and forth on whether or not 
um, a definition of veganism should be more rights-based just because in the grand scheme of things, it ends up reducing suffering more. Um, so that's kind of my long answer. I, I'm not quite sure what the definition is, but I know it should be something about um, morals and ethics rather than a diet or, mm. or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think there's definitely, there's definitely a lot of truth to the idea that um, how something is defined versus how it's used are often in conflict. And I think, um, for example, like, you know, when, if, if you're, um, if you're at a restaurant and you say, do you have any vegan options? Um, we're not, we're not asking them if they, if they have something that we can eat, which, um, has a, a moral objection to, uh, X, Y, Z, you know, ethical, um, treatment toward non-human animals. You know, we're, we're saying like, do you have any options that are suitable for vegans, you know? Um, but I also think that there is a popular uh, misconception of veganism as being something that's strictly dietary. Um, I mean, you hear, you hear a lot of people say, um, I'm a part-time vegan, or you'll hear people say, um, I eat, I, I, I'm vegan at home, for example. I just heard about this thing yesterday called like the social omnivore, where um, people will apparently uh, just, you know, eat a plant-based diet at home, but when they go out, they'll eat whatever and consider, you know, consider that a type of veganism. Um, I've heard all sorts of stuff, like people, uh, call, sometimes call themselves vegan, like if they're vegan, but they consume honey or they'll, they'll call themselves vegan, like if they consume eggs, but otherwise follow a plant-based diet. Um, so yeah, I think, um, there's, there's always attempts when there's something that's so hardline to kind of um, push the boundaries. Like, I, I think this is something that people ran into originally when uh, vegetarianism um, originally meant, you know, following a, a diet of vegetation, um, you know, things that grew from, from the earth. And people will, um, people would rather in the past have said, like, I'm a lacto-ovo vegetarian or I'm a lacto-vegetarian and, you know, and referred to, um, you know, milk with lacto, ovo, uh, with the term eggs. And um, nowadays, you know, if you say you're vegetarian, people just take that to mean that you um, consume a diet that's devoid of flesh. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think that it's, it's definitely a common misconception that um, veganism um, essentially just uh, means that somebody follows a plant-based diet. And then I think some people talk about like ethical veganism, where they're like, oh, this is like, the most extreme type of vegan where they don't, they strive not to consume anything animal based and also don't support the use of animals for entertainment, for clothing, experiments and the like. Um, so I guess um, one thing I wanted to ask you, and, um, like with regard to the utilitarian topic, I think, um, you know, I could think of a lot to ask uh, with regard to that. Um, Deem Stars here says, does Jerome still think eating lobsters is vegan? Um, did you want to answer that? Yeah, so I don't think I've ever claimed that eating lobsters was vegan. The most I've claimed about that was um, part of me is is at least somewhat agnostic on it, um, simply because they don't like have a brain. Though the what what makes me not like as confident as I am with like bivalves um, would be um, lobsters tend to uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Um, interact more i guess like aggressively when it comes to responses to stimuli um also there's there's just a, a ton more scientific consensus there's a lot more studies going on um that have um i know recently i guess i think it was last year a bunch of scientists came together and and claimed that lobsters are sentient so um i'm kind of i guess moved moving away from that position and um well, if I like, so if I see someone eating eating a lobster, I'm not as, um, I guess, angry, or, um, upset as I am if I see someone eating, um, like a pig, just because I'm not as confident that they're sentient. But I think the confidence level of lobster sentience right now for me is high enough, simply because of that scientific consensus, that um, I would say that lobsters are not vegan. Do you? Um... Thanks for answering that. Do you um, do you subscribe to a sentience hierarchy? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think some things are more sentient and some things are less sentient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, maybe we'll maybe we'll uh, have some time to talk about that later. But um, so I really wanted to ask you what your concept of rights is. Like, do you believe? Like, are you a um, believer in the idea of rights? Um, yeah. So, so it kind of depends on what you mean by rights, right? So, do we have um, inherent, like, inalienable, God-given rights? Absolutely not. I think. Yeah, absolutely not. We we do not. Um, do we have rights as far as like legal rights? Uh, like you know, we have rights in the Constitution, stuff like that. Yeah, we do, and and these can often be good things. Um, but it's not my ultimate. Um, legal rights are only good in so much that they reduce suffering or increase well-being. Um, I don't think there's. Uh, my end goal isn't rights. If that makes sense. Hmm. They're instrumental, but they're not um, the end goal. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I tend to be, um, I tend to be, I guess, um, slightly more toward the uh, moral anti-realism side myself. Like, I, I don't, I don't believe in, um, I don't, I don't think that rights are something tangible, at least. Um, and I, I don't, I don't really subscribe to this idea of, I mean. It would be great if everybody in the world subscribed to this idea of natural rights, like prescriptively speaking. But um, since it's it's essentially completely unenforceable, I think um, I, th I mean I think my concept of rights has been influenced by the world I've grown up in and live in. Also, to some extent, like I can't I can't negate that fact. Um, and I think I think that my best I my best estimation of rights is something that doesn't actually exist, but that it's beneficial for society to operate under under the guise, so to speak, that they do exist. Um, so, uh, I guess um, I guess we we agree in, in the sense that they're not they're not something that is tangibly there within everybody, but um, but that they can be beneficial. Um, and I think we might have some differing thoughts on just um, on how I guess how the manifestations of that recognition kind of play out, but uh, we can take some time to get into that in a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, so bivalves, you said that um, you're more confident in um, in somebody uh, being able to kind of eat them without angering you and things like that, or without, you know, you thinking that they were doing something wrong, let's say. Um, do you do you base that off like I guess um, anatomical or physiological uh, information that we have like a kind of a data driven thing um, and are, are you do you hold that position based on specific studies or kind of like what forms your um, your uh, position on that? Yeah, I basically um, hold the same position as the Nutrivore does, um, where. Uh, I kind of view it the same thing as taking a human off of life support, um, where if you were to receive some, you know, if you have a family that's going to receive some pleasure from taking their um, grandpa or whatever off of life support, um, who's like, you know, brain dead, who may or I guess if someone's brain dead, they may or may not be sentient, but I would probably assume they're not. Um, but if they're going to receive some sort of uh, pleasure from that, um, then I think it's probably okay. And then similarly, um, a bivalve who doesn't have a brain or really a central nervous system. Um, if we're going to, as vegans, receive some pleasure from just simply the taste or even just the added nutrients that we are often missing on a vegan diet from a, bi a bivalve, um, I think that's fine. Um, it kind of goes back to the whole utilitarian thing where um, the well-being... Um, of the nutrients and even the taste pleasure um, is probably higher than um, the suffering that would be caused to the bivalve simply because I don't think it's sentient. And even if it is sentient, it's probably not at a high level of sentience. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my position. Okay. Um, so I'm just trying to understand um, the, the kind of the last part that you said, I, I kind of was following till then. And um, I guess where I'd like to seek a little more elaboration is with regard to the as sentient or not as sentient part. Um, so do you think that like, uh, I guess, how would you, how would you um, 
define or describe like a, uh, a being's uh, possessing less sentience. Yeah, so okay, so basically how I would define sentience is just the ability to have an experience, um, typically an experience with preferences. Um, so uh, like you could have maybe an insect or something like this that like can see, can experience light and dark and they'd be sentient, right? And maybe they have a slight preference towards something that, something that's dark or something that's light. Um, and then you have something like a dog who can experience um, maybe maybe more experiences of pain and smell and eyesight and things like this. And then as we keep going up, we have a human, you know, who who can uh, rationalize things and who can think abstractly. And so that's kind of how I how I view the whole hierarchy of sentience. Okay, let me pose a hypothetical to you. Um... Do you think that like, let's say, let's say there was uh, this like gnat, for example, and um, let's say all that we know about the gnat in terms of the gnat's sentience is maybe just that the gnat is able to um, detect when food is in the environment um, and they can detect when there's light, when there's dark, but they have kind of a very rudimentary um, processing kind of system. Um, and I'm not sure what, you know, in, in reality, what gnats are really capable of or not in terms of like brain states and um, conscious experiences. But um, if if a human uh, was going to get like a lot of pleasure out of just swatting that gnat and killing them, and the gnat was just going to die pretty instantaneously, like the moment they were swatted, would you see that as something okay to do to that gnat? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, you're, you're increasing total utility there. Um, the the big issue would just, so in a vacuum, absolutely. The big issue is just, is that going to translate into bigger societal um, societal societal harms um, by allowing like sort of like sadistic pleasure to um, override, uh, I guess, bigger rules. But um Definitely just talking in that like scenario. Yeah, if someone experiences a lot more pleasure from just swatting the gnat, yeah. Do you see any, um, from from your utilitarian perspective, do you see, um, when you say utility, like, so the human drives pleasure, there's, um, as you said, some utility there. Do you see um, any inherent value to that gnat continuing to live, like not having their only life ended? Um, yeah, I mean, so assuming the net wants, wants to live, right? So there's going to be some pleasure there by allowing it to continue existing. It would just be if the pleasure of swatting the net for the human is higher. So I think it's wrong to cause extreme amounts of suffering for minute amounts of pleasure. And um, so yeah, that would be the question. It's like, does, is the, is the net suffering more than the pleasure of the of the human or yeah okay so i guess whether or not um if i understand correctly whether or not that um one of the factors i guess um concerning whether or not it would be okay to swat that gnat is um the gnat's uh degree of their desire to continue living yeah yeah absolutely i think if the gnat has a desire to live then it's and you uh won't receive more pleasure from it, then yeah, I think that's absolutely a, a thing we need to look into. Okay. And um, what do you think would be the kind of like cofactors that would lead to kind of a societal downfall um, potentially, you know, if, if it was normalized for people to just like swat gnats just for fun? Like, do you think, what do you think would be the potential factors influencing that thing kind of gaining, um, popularity like for example if you were just like in your room and you started um having like you know you start you kept a bunch of rotting fruit and a bunch of like fruit flies started populating your room and you were just killing them in private let's say you were just killing like thousands of of gnats just all day you know you had like specialized swatters and just like ninja style just jumping everywhere just swatting gnats like crazy and no one saw it and no one knew that you were doing it um 
in your es estimation, would that approximately or would that effectively um, negate the societal influence that that could have? I guess when you say like um, when you were talking about the effect that um, that, you know, uh, killing a gnat for pleasure could have on society at large, I guess, um, what do you see as the determinants of whether or not it that actually happens? Yeah, so my 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 uh, I guess question would be like, or the thing that I'm thinking about is, um, if we're if we're focusing so much on just this like this uh, pleasure of that you get from causing the suffering, um, will that translate into other aspects of your life? So, um, if we're kind of allowing this uh, pleasure from suffering is good, are you then going to start causing suffering to something that's even have a higher sentience? Um, are you going to start, you know, pushing your dog around or something like this? Um, but do you I, see I, that I, as a likelihood, like psychologically speaking, do you see that as, um, is, is that kind of a, um, um, an active concern, so to speak? I don't know. I, I, I lean towards probably, probably not. Um, at least for someone who's like philosophically minded, um, I think I don't think they would go in that direction. But maybe maybe for like just your average Joe, we have a society that um, says that it's okay to cause suffering um, for for pleasure. That it may lead to worse outcomes. But I think uh, yeah, overall, I don't I don't have a huge reason to be scared of that. I don't think. Not, a, not that I'm thinking about it, yeah. Interesting. I want to um, kind of shift gears, if we could, to um, something that you had said where um, you were saying that, you know, a person could derive um, some nutrients from eating uh, oysters or bivalves that uh, would be lacking on a plant-based diet. Um, and also, I think you had, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you had said when talking with a uh, reasonable vegan that um, you believe that maybe a Mediterranean style diet would actually be healthier than a fully plant-based diet. Um, could you, could you, I guess, uh, expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So there, there's, there's not, there isn't any nutrients that's missing on a vegan diet. Um, but there are nutrients that you likely might be missing if you, if you're not planning correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Right, so like the big one is you you'll need to supplement B twelve. Um, or, or oftentimes you might be missing on like vitamin D or omega threes and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean you could be low on um, zinc, you could be low on lysine. Um, yeah, I mean there's 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 certain um, there's certain things that are definitely a little bit harder to yeah. get. Yeah. So what we'll, we'll would make a like something like a Mediterranean, or like a, a maybe a plant based sort of heavy diet with animal products involved. The reason it would be healthier, at least in my view, is just because your average Joe um, is is going to be more likely to get all their needed nutrients simply just by eating um, and not having to worry about planning out their um, nutrients. If they just eat a variety of foods, though, they're going to be pretty set as far as nutrients goes, or at least more set than the vegan would be if they just ate and didn't plan. So Potentially. That's yeah, yeah I, I think, um, you know, it's important. I think that you can be healthy eating a non vegan diet in spite of the fact that it's not vegan. Um, like, I think uh, there's a lot of things that people eating um, a quote unquote omnivorous diet would also potentially be lacking in, like maybe uh, folic acid, maybe vitamin C, um, fiber would be a huge one. Um, but, but yeah, I think, um, I think there is definitely something to be said for um, the fact that when you eat a fully plant-based diet, it is good to be aware of certain things um, like, you know, certain amino acids that might be lower in, um, in uh, plant protein profiles um, and just making sure that you're actually consuming adequate levels of protein. Um, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, we get ragged on all the time. Like, are you getting enough protein? Are you getting enough protein? I mean, um, it's good to ascertain that you actually are for your body weight and activity level. Um, and then I think something else that needs to be taken into account is um, mineral profiles, um, essential fatty acids, especially like DHA, um, and, and kind of the ones that 
um, are more found in like marine sources, things like that. I think think that um, there's definitely some truth to the fact that it takes more careful planning. Uh, but I think all diets kind of take careful planning in order to um, be able to be healthy um, on them. Yeah, I would just say I think the vegan just takes a little bit more. Um, but I don't want that to scare people because it's pretty easy. I mean, I'm I, I don't like to cook. I'm I kind of just I'm not like a health guru or anything, and I've been able to do just fine for these, you know, three and a half years. Um, the biggest issue I face is just getting enough calories, and all I have to do is just eat more, which isn't an issue. Um, but yeah, I just go on, you know, uh, Chronometer or, you know, MyFitnessPal or any of these apps that you can show, you know, your calories in and, and all these things. Yeah, I've been and using Chronometer um, for the last, like, almost a month now um tracking calories and and nutrients and protein things like that i mean it's it's amazing when you're actually um cognizant of what's going into your body um i mean i i i lost about 20 pounds in a month doing that believe it or not yeah. like I, I was trying to lose weight and i restricted calories made sure i was getting enough macros um and and um yeah it's, it's pretty remarkable um but but i think what i would what i would ask you um just to kind of like make sure i understand your position on this do you think that it's more ideal to eat a well-planned plant-based diet like do you think that um if you look at i know you said you're not like a health guru but would you see there being any um benefit to eating like a perfectly planned non-vegan diet as compared to a perfectly planned uh plant-based diet uh i'm not sure I, I think if there is it's probably pretty marginal um i don't yeah, I don't think, you know, having a, some fish in, here and there is going to have a huge negative health um, consequences. And it, I think it'll probably have at least slightly um, good consequences. Um, if we're just talking about health, of course, I, mean, I don't think you should eat fish from an ethical stance. But um, I mean, even though yeah. from a nutritional standpoint, I mean, there's there's a lot of things in fishes ranging from like heavy metals to um, all sorts. Like if you go on nutritionfacts.org, I think like PCBs, heterocyclic amines, um, there's all sorts of like compounds that, um, at least on that site, uh, Dr. Gregor talks about with regard to eating um, ocean caught fishes. But at least I, I, I'm glad that um, that you consider that kind of a, a, a non-consequential factor and, and focus more on the ethics of um, not eating them. Yeah, and I think even with some people, it, it may even be healthier. Um, to eat a non-vegan diet just simply because of allergies or or something like that um but yeah it's it's a sep i think it's a separate issue it, it ties in sometimes um with with the ethics but essentially yeah it's a separate issue mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i think that there's you know people often talk about like how they have a friend who's allergic to like all vegetables and they're allergic to corn soy and wheat and like that they that they have to eat um, a, a non-vegan diet. Like I haven't, I haven't heard of anything personally where a person, like I, I don't know of any such uh, illness or disease that would cause somebody to have to eat things that come out of animals or to eat the animals. But um, I know that it's often recommended for people um, within kind of the mainstream medicine paradigm for people to eat uh, animals and their secretions. Um, and I think, I think there's also some kind of onus on us. Um, if we're vegans going against the kind of mainstream narrative of like meat, eggs and dairy and, you know, kind of like facing all that financial backing that these industries have and taking that um, pressure kind of on our shoulders in a way, um, I think there's an onus on us to kind of stand against that. I mean, a few years ago, um, I, I had been having some horrible digestive stuff going on and I was diagnosed with um, like a mixture of Crohn's and... Um, ulcerative colitis. They're like, you have features of both. We're going to call this indeterminate colitis. You got to, we, we recommend you get on these prescription um, anti-inflammatories and follow a low residue diet, which basically means like very low fiber. So they were saying like, you know, cottage cheese and different types of animal flesh and just stuff that stuff that basically has no fiber that's satiating. Um, and I just, you know, I walked out of there and never went back. And, you know, I, I could have, um, you know, some people maybe use IBS, IBD as reasons to um, go back to eating animals. But 
what did I do? Like, I just followed a really, I ate a very soft diet. Like I didn't eat anything with like hard edges, like nuts, crackers, all that stuff was out. Um, and I ended up healing it, you know, it took, it took some time, but, um, I think like, you know, I, my point is it's not to make it about my personal health. It's just to make it about, um, the fact that I believe that when there's a will, there's a way. And, um, I think like, you know, sometimes people have good intentions and are trying to help you, but they're also educated within those same paradigms of carnism that, um, you know, lead to the whole problem that we have with the whole killing machine and things like that. Yeah. A animal products make the world go around, I guess. <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, it reminds me of um, lifting, ve lifting vegan logic and his issues with Crohn's disease and how he kind of reversed them through veganism. Yeah, I've, I've heard a little bit about that too. And I'm really glad for him. Um, also, you know, like um, my, so my partner, she has a couple dogs and um, we, we cook plant-based food for them. Um, you know, so many people say that, oh, it's, it's not um, kind to, or natural or whatever, healthy um, to cook uh, plant-based food for dogs, but they're just, they're just thriving. And, you know, we make sure that we give them everything that they need. I'm actually going to do a video on this soon. Um, but essentially, uh, what we found is that as long as we make sure that they get um, taurine as part of their um, textured vegetable protein, and then also include things like uh, vitamin D, um, giving them like B vitamins in their water, and um, actually a little bit of creatine also, which tends to be a component of skeletal muscle, uh, which is found in you know animals. Um, they're able to be really healthy and, and really thrive on it, and they love it. Um, so. I think, you know, just, I think when there's a will, there's a way when, when it comes to nutrition. Um, so I wanted to kind of switch gears if we could to um, talk about um, your position on like zoos. Um, so I watched your, your video on that. Um, and the way I understand your position is kind of um, that you're concerned with um, the animal's well-being principally and that, um, kind of, if I understand correctly, that the exploitation or commodification that could be happening kind of like behind the scenes, so to speak, is kind of a non-issue um, as long as the non-human animal remains kind of unaware of the fact that they're being exploited or commodified, or as long as it maybe doesn't have a, a negative effect on their well-being. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. Um... I guess another part to add to that, which I think is important, is oftentimes this sort of exploitation may be necessary for a higher degree of well-being. Um, so, like, so, like, I, I'm not an antinatalist, right? I, I, I think life is actually it's better to have existed than to not have existed. Um, but, but I, I think that, like, um, you know, forcing someone into this life is is, is kind of a uh, like a rights violation type thing. It, it is sort of exploitation. If you know, I didn't choose to be here, but I was forced to be here. Right. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, uh, there was a court case. I think it was, uh, in India where, um, a child, uh, had, uh, I don't know. He wasn't a child at that point. I'm pretty sure. But you know, um, the, the, uh, the offspring of, of two humans actually ended up suing his parents for, um, giving birth to him without his consent. And I I'm guess not, his mom, I, yeah, his mom was a lawyer and I guess he ended up losing the case, but it was kind of like a, you know, one of those, um, uh, precedent setting kind of landmark court cases in a way. Cause it's just like, wow, like we've never seen anything like this before. Yeah. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty funny, but that's super cool. Um, but, but yeah, so when it comes to like, so I, I, I exist and I didn't consent to existing. Right. But life for me and i think for the majority of people is actually a net positive it's actually a net good so i would say that like yeah you should kind of force people into existence without their consent because they're they're gonna like it <laughs> they're gonna experience pleasure from it um so when it comes to uh things like zoos i i think there's an argument to be made that um, their their well-being is going to be greater in a zoo than it is going to be in the wild for many animals. Um, and it's also going to be greater um, that the, the zoos have animals exist that otherwise wouldn't have, and their existence is a net positive. Mm. Okay. 
And I, I also remember you had said that um, a sanctuary in a lot of ways is kind of similar to a zoo um, in the sense that like um, there's like, can you, I guess you were saying that, can you say, I'm just paraphrasing here, of course, but basically like, can someone claim in good faith that there is no exploitation going on if the sanctuary is collecting like ticketing costs and things like that, or, you know, donations, actively encouraging donations maybe um, for people to attend and to watch the animals there, basically? Um, so I, I think technically um, having ticket sales, um, there's an argument to me that, it, that it's definitely exploitation. Um, I would just say that the exploitation may be justified because it increases the likelihood of having more funds um, and things like that to increase the well-being of the animals. Um, yeah, it's like, so you have a, like a world with no, with no suffering, um, but also no like extreme well-being versus a world that has extreme well-being, um, but then like paper cuts exist. Um, I would take the world where paper cuts exist. Um, Could you so say that I guess, again? Yeah. So if imagine we have two worlds, right? And there's one world where there's just there's no suffering at mm. all. There's no there's no suffering, but there's no like uh, pleasure either. It's kind of just like a neutral world. Um, versus a world where um, there's tons of pleasure and tons of well being, um, but now we've added some suffering because paper cuts exist. Um, I would take the world where paper cuts exist. Now we've, you know, increased suffering. Um, but because paper cuts exist now, there's, um, for whatever reason, now there's extreme amounts of pleasure. I would take the paper cut world over the non-suffering world. So adding that to the whole like ticket sales, even if ticket sales increase some amount of exploitation and therefore some suffering, um, if the added pleasure of being able to increase um, funding for uh, welfare motives and things like this um, is greater than I think the exploitation is good. Mm, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess w the way that I've always approached, I mean, I, I, d I don't disagree at all that that it's a good thing for um, pr ticket proceeds to um, benefit the animals under the care at any given establishment, especially if that's what's vital to keeping them open. Um, on the topic of I guess like a symmetry breaker, or just a differentiator between um, a zoo and a sanctuary. Um, I would, I think, generally view it more from um, the perspective of uh, assessing the intentionality between, or you know, between the two, between the two entities or groups of people who gave rise to either establishment or institution. Um, so I would think like, wow, this zoo uh, is open for pleasure. Like they're probably taking animals out of their natural habitats, like out of nature. Um, they're probably supporting like people killing the family members of these like monkeys or whoever they're kind of kidnapping or abducting, I guess maybe would be the more proper term from the, from the wild. Um, and then they're confining them um, without any necessity. So they're not being rescued. They're just being kind of like abducted um, and confined uh, and, um, I wouldn't really make any, it wouldn't really influence my ethical judgment. Like I don't, I wouldn't think consequentially in terms of like, well, how would their life be in captivity? Would they potentially live longer versus how would their life have been in the wild? You know, would they have gotten in some kind of tribal warfare and ended up getting their brain eaten by a clan of chimpanzees? You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that far to make my um, ethical approximation. Um, I would just think more in terms of like, what are the intentions behind the people um, organizing either um, either business or institution and then kind of um, judge based off that, I guess. Um, and I think in the case of a sanctuary, um, the animals under the care of a sanctuary are being rescued. Um, and they kind of like, you know, a lot of them are just like literally taken off like a slaughterhouse truck or, um, you know, they they escaped and um the people who were going to otherwise kill them kind of like surrendered them um to the sanctuaries versus like in a zoo um they're being they're being brought there um th so their lives are kind of being disrupted um i do i do have um 
sympathy for the situation of let's say there's a zebra who's like eight or nine years old and let's say they were born in a zoo and all they know is zoo life and their chances of survival would um would not be good if they were to be released um but the the reason i look at their survival in that in that case in the, in the wild the reason i consider that a factor is because that would be kind of like post another intervention you know that would be um the act of releasing a being like you know um where whereby the subject of this release is incapable of caring for themselves i would say that would be unethical uh whereas um you know in the case of leaving them be in the zoo or i mean sorry in the wild versus bringing them to a zoo um, that's an active intervention where the subject is kind of otherwise um, unimpeded and kind of undisturbed. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, um, so first of all, I, I'm, I obviously I, I tend to focus on consequences more than intention, but there's something to be said about the intention of many zoos. You know, when it, only about ten percent of zoos are AZA accredited, and within those AZA accredited zoos, I don't think probably all of those zoos are ethical zoos a lot of them probably aren't you know an example would be like sea world is aza accredited mm, wow um yeah um so there's something to be said about like the intention of of zoos being more of like a profit pleasure type thing um i would just i would just say that's um that doesn't mean that that um like a theoretical like even if it's just theoretical um an ethical zoo couldn't exist um yeah, I, I had some other thoughts, but I'm, I've kind of lost my lost my train. Okay, I guess um, maybe maybe I'll 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 kind of reflect a little bit um, back um, uh, my thoughts, and maybe um, maybe that'll kind of spur your um, spur some dialogue on it. Um, so I guess what what I would consider an ethical zoo would be one that decided that they weren't going to um, force any more animals out of the wild to come into the zoo. Um, I could see potentially um, being sympathetic to a zoo who brought animals there for um, the, the like to remedy an extreme conservational kind of issue where let's say there's, let's say there's a panda, let's say there's like a pink panda and the panda is, I mean, I'm not even hundred percent sure on my thoughts on this, but I'm just, I'm trying to be kind of sympathetic to the zoo cause um, if there was a panda, like a pink panda, and there were only two of them left, um, I'm not sure how I would feel. I'd probably maybe still be against it. I probably still want to let nature kind of take its course if they were going to go extinct. Cause like, I don't know how I'd feel if like, you know, there was one, there was one panda, uh, on the Western end of China and one on the Eastern end and a zoo was like, okay, we got to bring these pandas together. They need to procreate. We got to preserve this panda species. I mean, at that point, at that point, I think I'd be if if I were to sign off on that happening and consider it ethical, I'd be focusing more on the external utility. Like I'd be focused on the extrinsic value of of those animals and the extrinsic value of um, their their different appearances or different species membership on biodiversity for the planet and things like that. Um, I think that in any case, it'd probably be worse for those animals to be taken out of their habitats. Like just, you know, imagining, uh, the fear of just being taken somewhere else and being put into confinement. And then you're sitting across this other panda who kind of looks like you, um, and, you know, just being maybe forced to do things that you wouldn't want to do things like that. Um, ultimately, like, I think, I think I would still be against that as well. Um, I think. I mean, on the grand scheme of things, is that as evil as like gassing, you know, hundreds of thousands of pigs a day in carbonic acid and slitting their throats? Probably not. But um, I think I still think that there is a lot of moral hazard in um, very, very well intentioned um, biodiversity con conservation efforts. Um, but one, but what I would say, if uh, as far as what I would call a zoo ethical because of, is like let's say there was a zoo that. Um, seized all animal imports basically for the lack of a better word and seized all um animal breeding practices within their facility and 
um, and kind of vowed to shut down ultimately after the last of the animals uh, living there had uh, been become deceased. Um, and then basically just kind of like cared for the animals living there uh, for the rest of their lives, um, assuming that they wouldn't be able to be, um, you know, they, they wouldn't have uh, a, a high um, viability of survival, so to speak, um, if, if they were to be released. Yeah, I, um, part of me agrees and part of me disagrees. It, it, it sounds a lot uh, like the whole, the common adopt, don't shop sort of position with, with, with dogs where it's like, um, owning rescued dogs is, is better than, or yeah, better than breeding dogs into existence. It's, it's really, it's a very um, astute, um, correlation that you draw there. And I had actually wanted to talk about that too. So maybe we could kind of feed two birds with one scone and maybe, maybe also talk about like, um, you know, if it, if it increased the enjoyment and well being of humans to breed, uh, let's say like, you know, toy poodles or, or like a breed of dog that um, kind of we're as humans keeping, um, keeping going, so to speak, um, in terms of their, um, uh, it's not evolution, but, you know, as far as their species trajectory goes into the future. Um, so that, that would be something if you could maybe also juxtapose that, um, as I think you started to do, I think that'd be a really um, beneficial aspect to the discussion too, if we could kind of broaden it. Yeah, so when it comes to um, yeah, breeding certain animals into existence, um, it, it again comes down to total, total, uh, total pleasure. So um, there are certain animals, um, especially certain breeds of dog, um, dog and cat, and even possibly even wild animals such as like maybe a cheetah, um, where their existence actually might have a higher net suffering than. Um, the well-being that we would receive from it um it's like you know like a certain i think i think like french bulldogs um like yeah they're cute and all and we we receive some pleasure from them but i think the uh huge amount of health problems that they have just from us breeding them uh it probably has a higher net suffering than uh than the pleasure that we get um but that's not true for all for all animals, and I think for many animals, um, they have a net positive life, and then we get a net positive life from them existing as well. So it really just increases the well being. Um, do you? Okay, so I guess um, from from what I understand, like if if we um, if 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 we breed an animal, uh, let's say a dog, and um, and that dog's um, life is good and they have a happy loving family who enjoys the presence of that dog for 10 15 years and then the dog passes away um you see that as fine basically yeah i see that as a, probably even more than fine probably a good thing i think we're increasing net, net utility in that case yeah okay um do you does your um does your estimation in terms of like what's involved in the net utility take into consideration the um, other animals who wouldn't get to have a loving family who, you know, let's say um, there's a pound full of dogs, like, you know, as, as you mentioned with the adopt, don't shop um, slogan, so to speak, um, would, would that also factor into the, the equation? I guess like maybe yeah. it, it might seem like a net positive if you zoom out a little bit, but then maybe if you zoom out more, do some negatives start to kind of meddle in with the um, with the calculations? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, there needs to be very strict regulation. I think you need to uh, get a license to own a pet. I think you need to have like follow certain trainings and be able to pass a test. And um, and I, I think we shouldn't. I don't think we should be breeding animals um, until we've adopted until we don't have any dogs on the streets or anything like that. Um, I, I, I am very much adopt, don't shop. Um, but then once we've adopted, then I, I don't see a huge issue with like an ethical shopping um, after certain regulations are put in place. I guess the difficulty with putting that into practice would be, um, you know, if if there is in your in your world or your I guess your estimation of like um, utility and uh, pleasure and 
pain and all that, um, we would almost have to like if, if it was important for the well-being of and, and I guess uh, maximizing utility in terms of enjoyment, pleasure, that kind of thing for humans, we would have to kind of keep a small amount at least of toy poodles or what, what have you um, alive and procreating in the meantime, you know, um, if we wanted to kind of empty out all the pounds and have um, have all those animals in, in loving homes, um, we couldn't just start those breeds over again. You know what I mean? There would have to be some people actively um, breeding them uh, all the while. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. And I guess, yeah, I guess I'd be fine with that then. Um, I, I really just think we need, like, I don't, I don't see an inherent issue with that aside from sort of extrinsic um, harms. Um, and those can be um, like lessened with, with regulation. Um, and we already have regulation when it comes to, you know, welfare of cats and dogs. You can be sent to jail if you are kicking a dog or something like that. Um, and we also have these regulations when it comes to taking care of kids as well. Um, yeah, I would just say keep those regulations, but it make them more extreme. Hmm. Yeah. I want to, um, I want to pause for a sec if we could, and, um, just look at the comments for a sec. So Rooted Sunshine asks, Jerome, could you speak more on why you think the zoo is better than the natural habitat for some animals? Yeah. So the, the wild is not a, not a Disney movie. Um, most of them do not survive. The survival rate in, in a in the wild is very, very low. Um, and when they do die, it's usually from something like starvation or being eaten alive. Um, they, animals tend to live longer in captivity. Um, and, and many animals, like such as dogs, they're very um, expressive. So you can really tell when they're, um, you can tell when they're sick, you can tell when they're happy, you can tell, um, yeah, so I, I think we can I think we can sort of uh, make these assumptions. Um, I have a question yeah. on that note. Like, let's say there was, um, let's say somebody had adopted or rescued a dog, and um, and this dog had a very um, strong, like, kind of hunting instinct. Like, let's say they, when when they were let outside um, to use the restroom, etc. Then they not restroom, I guess, but you know, use the outdoors as their restroom. They would kill like squirrels and birds and and rabbits and other uh, smaller animals. Um, and were, was trying to they were trying to eat them. Um, and it was clear that that dog had a high survival instinct. Do you think that the ethical thing to do in that case um, would be to allow that dog to like run out into a forest if let's say there was a forest nearby? um as opposed to keeping them in captivity like do you think the the ethical thing would be to just say like you know um you can go if you want to go yeah this is kind of it's interesting because it's it kind of brings up the like the vegan gains predators sort of um uh, conversation but mm -hmm. uh i would think so you'd be concerned would... about the deaths that they would inflict on others also like exactly maybe, maybe yeah Okay. So I guess maybe so, it would depend also on like, if you were feeding that dog, let's say a plant-based diet in captivity versus if you were going and buying like standard commercial dog food, that's full of protein isolate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I, if, if my dog had like, you know, drive to hunt and stuff, I'd, you know, try and, uh, find ways of play that would, um, mimic it, you know, play fetch or, or things like that. that Let me make this a little bit more difficult here. Oh, sorry to cut you off there. Um, so I was going to ask, like, uh, based on kind of this um, idea of feeding them, let's say, plant-based dog food or feeding them, or I mean, um, letting them kind of go and, and kill other animals and the effect that that would have in terms of like deaths that they would cause, what would be your thoughts on um, whether, let's say, let's say that like, you know, if they, if they were out, no, if they were out in a forest, that dog was killing lots of um, elderly kind of infirmed animals, um, kind of the de debilitated old ones who were kind of about to die and maybe had 
lives that were essentially suffering anymore by that point versus um, uh, buying like a commercial dog food. Let's say it results in like equal amount of deaths, but one, um, one of the scenarios involves the deaths of, like I said, like sick, old, frail animals who have a poor quality of life in the wild versus um, not only the deaths of like farmed animals, but um, deaths that were kind of preceded by um, having like a, a, a life of being factory farmed and things like that. I guess um, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated, right? Because it, I, I guess, does it, it might also matter to you whether those beings who were factory farmed were factory farmed in like high welfare standards versus factory farmed in situations where they might have been very young, but have known nothing but misery for their whole lives. It's, 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 it's all very kind of like convoluted, but um, I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, do you, do you give any um, consideration, I guess, to um, the situations of uh, like an animal in the wild and let's say hunting, for example, like, would you consider that more ethical? Maybe, maybe, maybe that that's what this is all kind of pointing toward versus um, like the exploitation commodification, I guess, like maybe, maybe I'm trying to say like, just because an animal is under um, the care or captivity of humans, um, it doesn't always necessarily mean that they have a better life, I guess. Gotcha. Um, I, I, okay. So I guess a, a quick little ramble to sort of answer a lot of those questions would be, yeah, I guess I apologize for the ramble too. <laughs> um, so I think a big, one of the big issues of why animals tend to suffer in the wild is because they don't have uh, the mental state to be able to like morally reason about things. Um, their experience is really just that it's, it's, it's their experience. So like a human, if a human breaks its leg, it can um, uh, maybe understand a bigger picture of why they broke their leg. Maybe they were playing soccer or something and they broke their leg and they can sort of be like, you know, it's okay because, you know, I'm, I'm it was the risk I was willing to take for playing soccer and stuff like this where, an animal kind of just breaks its leg and then has to experience a broken leg and can't, you know, rationalize this bigger picture. Um, so by, by intervening in the wild and having a human um, sort of overlook, we can be the animals, uh, moral reasoners, right? So it's not like, it's not, it's not the owl firefighters that put out the, uh, the natural wildfire. Um, or it's not like the, um, the the lifeguard dolphins who push the beach the, who push the beach to whale back into the ocean. It's you know it's these humans who can overlook and can see the bigger picture and can um, intervene in these scenarios. Um, so basically, by us intervening, we become the the abstract thinkers. We become the moral reasoners. Very similar to how. Um, we may force our kids to eat vegetables um, because we see a bigger picture of health. You know, if, if if you're a kid and you want to just eat candy all day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as a parent, you probably aren't going to allow that. Um, I guess what yeah. gets kind of tricky for me is when when we think that we see the bigger picture, but we're kind of misguided or maybe just like really narrow visioned or kind of myopic in our um, approximations of like what's actually going on. Um, and then we kind of use our estimation of what we see, like our interpretation as a reason to interfere. Um, you know, that's always, that's always my concern is, is our um, anthropocentrism kind of leading us to do things, um, interventionally speaking, in, in the wild or to other animals where we think we're seeing the bigger picture. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if a, if a carnist says like, well, life consumes life and that's just the way it is. And you got to zoom out from your first world privilege and realize that this is the natural order of things. And it's always going to be this way. And like, you know, kind of tries to, tries to kind of like brush off any kind of ethical notions entirely um, by virtue of the fact that um, 
you know, uh, we inherently um, are harm causing beings. Yeah, I, I uh, definitely don't want to like make an appeal to nature. Um, but I, I, I do think that we can, uh, that we might have to just dis disagree, but I do think we can sort of see when suffering is happening. Um, and it's easier for us because we, we are, uh, even if we might be wrong about the big picture, I think we're right enough to where we can make these assessments. I think there definitely are times um, when we can. Um, and I, I think science is, is a great tool in, in that aim in terms of um, being able to, um, you know, if we can reproduce certain results consistently, then we have good reason to believe that uh, that would kind of hold water um, into the future um, in any given case, whether it's like eating vegetables, being generally good for people, um, or even in the case of like, um, uh, quote unquote pets. I mean, like, uh, there are some animals who live a lot longer when they're in captivity, as opposed to when they're in the wild. Um, I guess it just, um, begs the question of like, whether or not it's ethical to, um, to keep an animal. And, and of course, um, an important thing to also consider is like I said, with like the example of like the, the zebra, um, you know, if they have been raised and have no, known nothing but captivity, then then it changes the situation, in my view. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess it's kind of a there, there's a lot to consider um, in the topic of like ethics of of keeping animals captive, essentially. Um, I mean, uh, one could even argue, you know, in the sense of um, raising children, like, um, do we have an obligation to um, if you if you have a kid and and all that they're doing is wanting to run out into a road where they would get run over by a car in a heartbeat, um, do you have an obligation to protect that child from having that happen to them? I would say absolutely, unequivocally. Um, so I think I think um, it gets tricky when the topic of like protecting um, people, and I, I say people to include non-humans, like protecting people from themselves, becomes kind of a tricky scenario yeah i can it can it can get tricky but i i think it's a lot of aspects it's it's a uh, it's less tricky than we we'd, we'd like to realize i think would you be in favor of um kind of segregating like let's just say wildlife as as a as a broad term um in such a way where um like let's say you know like lions were kind of quarantined somewhere and the animals that they would kill let's say gazelles zebras antelope they were um quarantined somewhere else where each population was was getting fed um, a nutritionally adequate diet of let's say you know the lions were getting fed lab-grown meat the gazelles were being fed um uh some kind of vegetation you know everything else aside whether it's environmental impact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, or, you know, crop deaths, blah, blah, blah. Like, would you say that that would be a good thing to do just in terms of like these highly sentient beings um, not incurring this like tremendous suffering in terms of like protecting the gazelles and continuing to feed the lions? Like, would you consider that kind of like segregation or separation of them to be a good thing? Yeah, so I don't see much of a difference between a zebra being stabbed by a knife versus being stabbed by like a lion's tooth. Um, I think the suffering is the same. Um, but in this scenario, so, they're not being stabbed at all. When if they're segregated, yeah. they're just they live out their lives, you know, and have and presumably die of old age. They're protected. Exactly. Yeah. So um, in, in 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 sort of like a vacuum, where of course, and you already mentioned this, we're, we're not taking into account like maybe. Um, environmental, e ecological harms that may exist. I think that would be better. Yeah, I think. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan of this idea that if the lab-grown meat technology is able to gain a stronghold and become uh, economically producible, where um, it's having a minimal cost, um, that, you know, I, I think it would be a great thing to be able to just airdrop pallets of um lab grown zebra flesh onto lions and 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 help those um help those lions satisfy their hunger and nutritional needs without um causing deaths of lions like i'm 
I'm a huge fan of using technology for for that purpose. Um, I think that um, it kind of oftentimes sounds a lot like arguments that carnists use against veganism as a whole to appeal to nature and say, well, you know, we ought not to intervene at all. And that's just the way that nature is, etc. cetera. Um, I just think at this point, it's probably, it's probably the, the extent of um, quote unquote wild animal suffering is so large that it's almost futile to even try to intervene. I mean, sure, we could save the lives of a few select individuals, but I mean, just on the whole, um, it's almost like uh, it's almost an it, it, it's almost to the point where um, there's almost like futility just in grasping the overall picture, how big the picture is in terms of like chickens grazing and pecking at insects versus like tuna fishes and piranhas and all the other fishes kind of eating each other. Um, you know, we'd have to, if you think about how big the earth is, if we became kind of like the policemen of the animal kingdom and just made sure that nobody's rights were violated, essentially, um, you know, we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to survive ourselves. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have any life left after that. And, and I still think it would be a totally insurmountable task. Um, and I think there'd also be some unforeseen consequences on, uh, the animal kingdom for us, of us doing so. But I do think that, um, if we were able to use like, you know, very, very, um, technologically advanced, um, you know, hydrogen power, blah, 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 like stuff that where we could just, if we could produce copious amounts of lab grown animal flesh and distribute it to other animals using like, um, you know, hydrogen powered planes and things like that, where we're basically just, um, causing very, very little environmental impact and helping, um, Kind of caretake for a lot of animals i think that that would be a very uh noble vision of the earth where we're kind of like these stewards of the planet we're preventing a lot of animals from suffering horrific deaths and you know they're they're kind of um they're all kind of fed and good yeah absolutely uh I, something to add um so there was a response you might be familiar with it there was a response to the peter singer's thought experiment of uh, like saving the drowning child um are you familiar with with um, um his... I would I think I, I could use a little refresher if you wouldn't mind, please. Yeah. So okay. So Peter Singer has this sort of thought experiment. He wrote it in this paper. I'm forgetting the name of it, but um, where if you're you're walking on some trail and you happen across a drowning child, um, that um, even if you were to get your new Gucci shoes dirty and ruin your new shoes, um, you should still save the child. Um, and then he makes this like, gives, brings this idea where it's like, what if the child is a, is across the world and you'll, you know, lose the cost of your shoes to save the child. You should probably still save the child. And then he, and then this is where he gets into like effective altruism where he says, you know, there's all these charities that um are very effective at saving lives um so so rather than buying gucci shoes and you know excess um things we, we should spend that money on charity because charity yeah. actually works um and there's a response to that um and it was it was not it was titled something something like you should let the child drown or something like this mm. um where it gives this um counter example uh he says like peter singer's example is m something more like you are going to the bank or you you get a call and says hey your bank account's been um taken over and 200 dollars is being taken every five minutes um and if you don't come to the bank now and sign this paper then we'll start taking your possessions as well um and then on your way to the bank you see just hundreds of thousands, you know, millions of people who are drowning. And it takes you just, it takes you exactly five minutes to save um, these kids from drowning. Um, so it's like, surely you should save at least some of them. You should save a good amount of them, but eventually you're going to want to go to the bank and sign the paper. Um, and you can't, um, you, it's, the problem is so big that you can't save all of the all of the kids from drowning. Um, and eventually you're going to have to let some of them drown to sign, to sign the paper. So all your possessions and all your entire life isn't just taken from you. Um, and I think that's pretty, 
I guess sort of similar to the situation with wild animal suffering. It's just so large. Um, and surely we should do something about it. But um, eventually we're going to have to just um, go to the bank and sign the paper. It's interesting. I wonder um, if this example is kind of based on the, the, the nature of currency being essentially like a fiduciary. Um, I wonder if, if this same example would kind of, um, if, if it would be uh, equally, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, analogous. If, um, if, this, if this was like you have um, a certain amount of, of gold in the bank or a certain amount of like hard um, things of like tangible value, I guess more so than, than I mean, because I guess um, in a sense, you know, uh, money's being printed all the time. It's being constantly devalued. And um, maybe, maybe I, I'm not sure if that also influences this hypothetical scenario here. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can change you can change um, the value of whatever the thing is that you're you know you can you can go instead of having money in the bank it could just be like utility points or something. Hmm. Um, it, it, the 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 example. I guess just, what I'm sorry. Enough, yeah. I guess what I'm failing to grasp exactly is the is the fact that it's constantly being taken out. I guess what's the force that's constantly taking it out without your stopping it? Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, as far, I mean, so in, in the, in the hypothetical, it, it's, it's, a uh, it's just something that's, that's happening. It's just something that, that's existing. Um, but I guess, I guess if we're kind of reflecting on it, it could, it it's, um, so, so how do I say this? Um, it, it's basically like utilitarian slavery is what is a kind of a term for it. So, um, I, I mean, I bought fruit gushers the other day, right? I didn't need to buy fruit gushers. I could have spent that on charity, right? I have this, I have this microphone here. It's a Shure SM7. Um, I don't need this microphone. I mean, there's a microphone on my on my laptop. Um, it seems like everything that I, that I do buy um, could have been spent on charity, um, and that's kind of where the the um, the money coming out is. It's like um, there's there's so many kids that are drowning right now um, and you could spend all of your resources on, on saving the drowning kids, but because it's so large, um, eventually you buy some fruit gushers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see where you're coming from. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a noble thing to, to kind of constantly be thinking about the, um, effects that we, we could be having, you know, for um, increasing well-being in the world, or, you know, if you want to call it maximizing global utility or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's a definitely a, a tough situation to be in where um, you're kind of your own worst critic in that sense. Um, and I think, like you say, you know, eventually you go and buy some fruit gushers or um, you essentially accept your imperfection as, as a human um, and, and try to just kind of um, not, not violate other beings as much as you can. Um, this is kind of why I like to focus less on, um, the kind of like net, net positive kind of thinking and try to think more because I mean, there's so many unknowns when you kind of extrapolate a given behavior onto, um, into, in terms of net effects. But I think one thing that we can be really clear about is like the things that have to happen to cows for the, for dairy, for example. Like we're, we're very cognizant of the fact that they're like forcibly impregnated, that they have their babies taken away and things like that. Like just like very unnecessary and arguably cruel things that we do. Like, or think about something like, I don't know, dog fighting, for example, or like the fur trade. These are things that are like egregiously torturous and um, violent and harmful. Um, my My approach to veganism has always been like, you know, if, if I can be happy and healthy um, without needing to um, cause these types of rights violations, that that's, that that's the thing to do. Um, it gets really, really tricky, of course, if we come from a perspective of how can I cause the least um, harm in the world or how can I be responsible for the least amount of suffering? Because um, as your example kind of highlights, um, in some way, like you can't choose not to choose. 
And if we're, we can't just, you know, sit idly on a, on a big bank account and, and um, ignore the fact that we could be using that money for something better. You know, just, just even that inaction of not spending it toward charity and just letting it sit there um, is in a sense, a choice that we're making. Um, yeah. There's kind of no such thing as an inaction. Yeah. Right. Inaction right. is an action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why I like to also, I mean, on that note, I think, I think veganism is something that's close to a non-action because, um, you know, besides the processes involved in going vegan, once you like what I like to think to myself, and this maybe is, is something that you could carry into your discussion with uh, reasonable vegan about, um, defining veganism accurately is that, um, essentially if you know that someone's vegan, um, you really can't make any positive claims about them because they could, they could define veganism differently. Um, the only thing you could really do, I would say is that you could say what they don't do. Um, or maybe, maybe if I, to speak in less absolute terms, um, if you know that someone's vegan, you have a higher likelihood of being accurate in referencing things in which they don't participate or things that they don't favor happening to non-human animals than you would of uh, being accurate if you were to make positive claims like about things that they're like this or they they like this or they like that or things like that if that makes sense yeah yeah like a okay. really big simplification if i sorry sorry just to, just to add as a little footnote for example um rather than saying like they love animals or something they respect animals blanketly like that you might be more likely to be accurate if you just said like they're not in favor of uh animals being uh, uh violated against their consent or something like that like you'd be able to make claims relating to uh, more of a notion of negative rights yeah i could see i could see that that, that would be more um less confusing uh, especially if you're trying to define something um you you want less room for interpretation um exactly yeah i can i can see that definitely yeah um i i just wanted to talk a little bit about um so i know we, we've gone through a lot of stuff from we've talked about rights and defining veganism earlier and uh, breeding of animals um and this kind of like uh net positive thing we briefly touched on um i know we're, we're coming up to about an hour and a half here and um, I really, uh, I apologize again for, for being like an hour late to the stream. So I don't want to take up a whole lot more of your time here on this, uh, beautiful Saturday coming into the summer here. But, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the net positive kind of like, um, calculus here. Um, because I, I don't think that people who have like, that's not how I view the world at all. Um, that's not how I approach ethics, but I'm always trying to, um, uh, you know, for my own personal utility, I guess I'm always trying to expand my um, ability to kind of view situations or scenarios from different vantage points, um, even if those aren't like kind of my points of perception um, and, and try to understand. Um, and, and I always um, assume that if somebody subscribes to veganism and they're coming at their calculus uh, in a thoughtful manner that they, they have, you know, only the best of intentions in terms of like um, wanting to uh, see the world be a good place for everybody. Um, when I think about, uh, a being, for example, who's been like brought into the world, um, to kind of allude to Peter Singer's like uh, net positive thing that, uh, I think him and Alex O'Connor had talked about that. Um, if, if like, so, you know, just to fill anyone in, who's maybe not familiar with it, I, and I don't want to misquote him or mischaracterize his argument, but from what I understand it, uh, and, and, uh, Anna Christina Harris had made a comment here. Um, that's kind of similar to slavery it used to be a net positive for some people. Um, if you had a being like, if you brought a, a cow or a dog into the world and, and you showed them nothing but love, gave them a great, uh, happy life as much as you could. Um, and then kind of like, you know, one day when they were sleeping, if you injected them with something that like makes their heart stop painlessly while they sleep, um, it seems like Peter Singer, and it seems like you also, based on what I've heard, um, correct me if I'm wrong, of course, uh, would consider that to have been like an overall positive thing. Um, is that correct? 
Uh, almost, almost, yeah. So, um, Peter Singer had a conversation with Alex O'Connor, and he answered a very similar question. Um, but the big sort of um, situation with the question that that would make it okay um, to end their life would be that these people wouldn't have, or these animals wouldn't have existed otherwise. Um, so I think it's wrong to rob somebody um, to, to end someone's life if they have a preference to continue existing. Um, but if, but if this robbing of their life, so in, in the Alex O'Connor versus uh, Peter Singer podcast, um, Alex asked um, if there was uh, some subset of humans that um, they were in some sort of um, religion or some society where at 18, they were killed painlessly. Um, by their parents or something? Yeah, by like their church leader or whatever. Oh, okay. Like they're killed painlessly um, because it's like part of their culture or whatever. Um, but these people wouldn't have existed otherwise if they weren't killed at 18. Would it be morally okay to kill them at 18 um, within that society? Um, and that's sort of the, the, the question that was... Uh, like proposed to Peter. And I think obviously, yes, I think you should kill them at 18 um, because I think existence is better than non-existence. Yeah. I guess I'm kind of a little bit hazy on the um, wouldn't have existed otherwise part. I'm trying to think of maybe um, a real world kind of scenario where, um, I mean, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um like I understand in, in the case of like, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example and maybe, maybe this will lead us lead us out somewhere kind of out of the woods of um, of the uh, conditions in the scenario. But like, if there's parents, let's say these, these um, let's say there's, there's a lady who uh, she wants to make a collection of um, aborted fetus. Like she wants to just basically have like a room in her house where she just displays um, fetuses in jars, like just, you know, swimming in, in like some kind of solution. And like, it's gonna be this like centerpiece of her house. Let's say like, you know, in her, in her living room, like behind her TV, she just has a whole backdrop of like shelves and she just wants to put like, you know, 30 jars, like, you know, pretty, bi pretty big size jars with like, I don't know, uh, six month old fetuses or something in them. Um, so she's constantly getting pregnant and constantly getting abortions. Um, these fetuses wouldn't have existed if this lady hadn't, um, conceived and let's say she intentionally conceives them, um, for the sole purpose of adding to her pickled baby fetus collection. Um, would you see that as a net positive if, if they were aborted painlessly? Um, and don't feel put on yeah. the spot. Like if you don't, if you don't, if you need to think about it, I don't want, I don't want to like try to force an answer out. Yeah. So the big, so, okay. So the big question for me is, um, or so the two big things I'm thinking about when it comes to these like conversations is number one is, uh, do they have a net positive experience? Um, like like yeah, they get is, to swim in a womb. They're like floating around, they're kicking and stuff. She plays like Beethoven for babies on her stomach and they, they dance around and stuff. And then she's like, all right, six months, they've got to weigh about this much. They've got to be about these dimensions. I only have like a four quart jar or something like that. So they can't get any bigger. They've all got to be a uniform size. And, you know, she takes some drug that causes uh, that baby to, to die. And then they like, you know, she somehow harvests their their uh, their corpse from her yeah yeah I think I think if they wouldn't have existed otherwise they have a net positive experience yeah I think I think that'd be okay I mean I might have to reflect on that more but I think as of right now that seems like it'd be okay interesting very interesting um yeah, I, you know, I, again, like, I guess the way that I always approach things is more from a perspective of um, that person's intentions. And I guess, like, you know, abortions sometimes happen 
uh, where, you know, people didn't intend to get pregnant and they make a very difficult decision. Um, and, you know, it's not a situation that, that they ever saw themselves getting into. Um, but I guess in this scenario, since the, the act is very intentional of conceiving that life and then ending that life, um, having no good reason to believe that that subject of the life wanted their life to end, that's, that seems uh, troublesome to me. It seems like ethically, uh, I would be ethically averse to um, signing off on that being okay, personally. Yeah, I mean, it's, for me, it, it, it kind of goes back a little bit to my, um, I guess, my, my position on abortion itself, where, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think the intention matters too much. I think it matters whether or not the uh, fetus can suffer. And if the fetus is having a net positive experience, then I don't, yeah, so... Um, I don't want to like get sidetracked into the, into like an abortion conversation, but sure. I'm es essentially, uh, uh, at least legally I'm pro sentient. So, um, if the, if the fetus can feel pain, if it's aborted, then, then, uh, it'd be wrong to abort it. But yeah, in this, in this sort of scenario where they're having a net positive experience, yeah, I think it'd be fine regardless of intention. Interesting. So I, I guess, um, I guess what you, what you're saying is very much kind of like the counter argument or like kind of the, the, um, perspective that kind of butts heads a lot with the rights-based approach where, um, it's kind of, um, ascribed like, uh, to other beings, uh, this notion that they possess some kind of inherent rights intrinsically, um, which like once they're, uh, kind of, um, conceived or once they're, um, and of course abortion kind of like flies in the face of this. So that's always a difficult topic. Um, so, um, I guess we'll kind of like push that aside for a second here, but, um, I guess there's this idea that, you know, one, like, uh, maybe, maybe taking the example of the 18 year old person in the, in the religious cult or whatever that, that example, um, the, the rights-based person would say that they, um, have an inherent right to live. And then maybe, um, the person who was focused more on, um, I mean, I'm not sure, I guess like the way that, like the thing that makes their life being ended when they're 18, uh, even if they have a desire to live, um, by your approximation would just be the fact that they owe their existence in a sense to that cult or like to that, to whoever is deciding to end their life. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Yeah, it's it's um yeah, they wouldn't have existed otherwise if, if that cult didn't exist and Yeah, I think that's I some so a, a way to put it is like um Yeah, if, if your well-being is increased um because of a rights violation, then the rights violation is good. Hmm. And and in this case, the rights violation is the act of that that cult taking the person's life. I guess I fail to see how that would increase their well-being if if that's what you're referring to. Yeah, so it would increase their well-being because um, it, the the, the uh, taking their life at eighteen is the reason they exist. Mm. Um, and without existence, um, there's no there's no well-being experience. I see. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of I guess it's it is pretty analogous to the to the pickled uh, baby thing. Um, you know, given that the reason that this woman keeps uh, conceiving babies is to add to this collection. Um, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's something that I'm going to have to reflect on more. I don't see my view on it changing, um, but I definitely think that um, that there's some utility, for the lack of a better word, in just considering different people's perspectives. Um, and I think that... Um, I think that, you know, anyone coming from a rights-based perspective um, ought to consider the kind of credence that you give to the idea of existing in the first place. Um, I still don't think it's, it's like, I, I still think that the way that um, uh, animals, I guess, and including humans, um, value our existences ought to be of paramount importance. Like, I think even if somebody doesn't value their existence, like 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not really a fan of, um, you know, I know some countries are doing things like um, uh, letting people decide to end their own lives if they so desire. Suicide. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that either. Like, I think that, um, I think that people should be encouraged to, to use the one life they have to find greater levels of well-being and, um, and things like that. But I guess in these specific scenarios of like, um, I don't know, like a. Uh, something almost being built into the question, like this 18 year old's life is ended and um, they're part of a cult that's just bringing them into existence in order to end their life at 18. I don't know. I, I'd still, I still consider that a huge tragedy. I mean, I, I still, um, I would, I would be like, well, you know, that rule was kind of made to be broken in a way, you know what I mean? At that point, like I would kind of want, want life to find a way to succeed through that. I wouldn't want that like if, if there was like a, you know, a Disney movie or something centered around this cult and we got to know this character and they were, you know, 17 years old at the beginning of the movie. And then the movie was following them up to the point where they turned 18 and they had a whole like vision of all the things that they wanted to do in their future and their life was just going to be ended. Like I would still consider that a huge tragedy. Maybe yeah, so I, I would ask you, I guess, would you consider it a tragedy as well? Yeah, so there's there's um, sort of the in a vacuum answer, which is kind of what we've been talking about is like within the hypothetical. Um, but then there's the kind of the real world um, example where it's like in the bigger picture, we want to we probably just want to end the cold and, and bring people into existence that don't have to be killed at 18. Mm -hmm. um, but assume assuming we're just talking about the confinement of the, the cold. Other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see where you're coming kind of, from in, in, in like it's a difficult position. Um, and and uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar. It kind of reminds me of um, this kind of consequentialism versus versus um, principled kind of approach. Where I guess like they both kind of feed into the other. This is something that um, uh, Akash. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's um, a vegan abolitionist who's been in uh, some different discussions, um, live streams online, including with myself. Uh, we have another one planned for next week, but we basically. Um, talked briefly about um, like a deontological approach versus an approach uh, toward, you know, ethics and toward uh, animal ethics specifically, or an approach where we're kind of um, looking at the consequences. And um, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the idea that, you know, they kind of seemingly um, are kind of opposite sides of a coin in some way, because um, if you're basing if you're basing your estimation of if your if your normative ethical framework is based on what happened or what would happen as a consequence, you're kind of, in a sense, internally seeking some kind of rule or principle uh, to be the, a deciding factor. It's like the at the end, you know. It's, it's almost like there's an invisible intention of following a principle. And the same this, in the same vein, you wouldn't really have anything to base your principles off of if you hadn't observed any consequences of, of anything uh, prior to that. Yeah. The um, while, while there is some differences, which put them in different categories, they, uh, for the most part, they end up coming to the same conclusions. Um, it's like, like utilitarianism. Oftentimes you, we, have, we start, um, we start introducing aspects of like rules and stuff and things like this. And like deontology will often eventually put to it, to its extreme will most deontologists go into something called like threshold deontology right. where it's like you start to f focus more on the suffering of things rather than the rights of things and so there's a lot of overlap and eventually we all kind of come together and and have very similar um uh s solutions to to, to to different issues um yeah but that being said me, there's oh sorry go ahead yeah that being said there's there's still differences which put them in you know why we have different things but yeah for the most part we um end up just wanting to wanting like you know the abolition of factory farming and um stuff like that yeah yeah i think um i think probably you know it, it can even be problematic to i think try to try to figure out what kind of camp quote unquote you fit into in terms of your school of thought when it comes to philosophy and ethics and morals, because a lot of times we're kind of like, we're poor, we're poor metacognizers in terms of like, 
even thinking about our own thinking, a lot of times I think it can be like um, chasing our own tail in a way. Um, from what I've heard, um, like a threshold deontological approach sounds to me like most in line with my um, worldview, which is of course based on my beliefs. Um, but um, I do run into problems sometimes, like like you said, you know, you sometimes are are um, forced by a hypothetical scenario. Uh, you know, you alluded to um, thresholds, um, and you know, as I was saying, sometimes you're forced into these uh, scenarios where you're kind of um, needing to make a judgment. Where, like, you know, let's say, um, like, there's this idea, um, this hypothetical that I had posed to um, Akash, uh, who's a doctor. I was like, you know, if you had like, I think I the number I used was like five um, patients who all needed organ transplants. And then you had one healthy patient who had, you know, perfect healthy organs that could save the lives, uh, could like, would be very likely, I guess, to save the lives of these other people, um, prolong their lives, prolong their well being. Um, would it, would you be, would you think that it would be justified to take that person's life in order to uh, save the lives and, and bring health to um, these, let's say, five other people? Uh, he was like, no, I wouldn't consider that an ethical thing to do. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I wasn't bringing this up to ask you about it, but I guess now that I have, um, I, I would be curious about your thoughts on it. Yeah, it is a very, it is a classic um, utilitarian, like reductio of the organ harvesting. Um, yeah, I wouldn't think it'd be moral um, because now every time you go to a hospital, you're afraid of being the guy that gets, you know, <laughs> Um, it, yeah. it's creating yeah but um but then again it would uh, if we translate this into like a vacuum scenario and someone could go in um if, if someone could get away with it essentially right um if, if who could get away with it the doctor the doctor like if there was no extrinsic consequences um if five people were, were going to die right and now um less people are going to die it's it's like it, it, it's the trolley problem essentially, right? If you pull the lever um, to kill the one person and save the four, I think that's a good thing. Um, and the issues only come with when you take it outside of the vacuum, when um, there's people watching, or if it sets some sort of precedent where you can now start, you know, pushing people in front of trolley tracks. Yeah, things like what this. I run into, um, maybe as a consequence of just my ethical framework, is that. I, I don't want to be the person pulling the lever to kill anybody. I, I kind of, I kind of, I'm much more inclined to be on the side of, um, the, the passive observer, as opposed to the instantiator of, um, that harm. Um, and I guess that's just kind of, it's, it's something that I, I, I grapple with because I'm like, okay, what if, you know, this number instead of saving five people was saving, you know, 100,000 people or something like that. Um, and then I think what ends up happening inside, you know, this calculation inside my brain is I start thinking about, um, I start thinking in terms of utility, you know, when I think about these trolley problems, I think about um, the effect that saving those people is going to have in terms of other lives. And like, am I ultimately, um, by by intervening at all, Am I going to ultimately end up causing more harm and even suffering um, by doing so? You know, and and it's not to say that I think it's it's a good thing at all to end other people's lives in order to save lives. I don't. Um, it's it's kind of a similar thing to like you know if you have like a, a a quote unquote pet in your house and you're killing other animals to feed that animal. Like I think that's totally wrong. Um, but I guess um, to bring it back to this trolley problem example, like I think that. Um, what I, what I always refrain, want to refrain from doing is being the deciding person, like to be the cause uh, the direct cause of, of those lives being ended. I almost am more inclined to let a process that's in motion, um, continue up until a certain threshold. I feel like, and I don't know where that threshold is. Yeah. I think the, the modern vegan movement. I think mostly agrees with you. I think most of them tend to be threshold deontologists that have similar thoughts. Um, for me, it's very easy for me to pull the lever. And I think if I didn't pull the lever, I think I would lose sleep. I'd, I would have nightmares that I should have pulled the lever um, when it comes to just one versus five, even even 
with that small number. Yeah, I mean, and I don't mean to make light of five lives, you know, even as I was saying the example, I was like, you know, if it wasn't five, it was whatever, like, I have inherent, uh, nervous, anxious ruminations the whole time I'm, I'm even talking about that, you know, like, it's a very, it's a very um, difficult situation to grapple with, you know, it's like, it truly is a problem, you know what I mean, to, to have your hand on that lever and, and, and to try to know what to do. Um, it's, you know, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of these questions, um, I think they're, they're really valuable in trying to get to the heart of what our ethics are, whether it's this problem or whether it's the problem of like, uh, you know, the, the Peter Singer net positive thing or the pickled babies. Um, I think these things are really useful in narrowing down, um, to like narrowing down what we believe and getting to a point where we're really clear on our, on our ethical stances. Um, and and I don't think there's disutility in, in talking about them. I think I think it's a it's a good use of time, um, but I think that also um, there's a lot to be thankful for as it pertains to the fact that we don't have these issues so um, so in our face day to day. Um, and of course, uh, what comes to mind right now is this this charity thing that we talked about. You know, in, in many cases, I guess or from, from certain perspectives or with this, with a certain degree of awareness, we kind of do always have this problem. Um, but I guess a really, um, something to be thankful for ultimately, whether you're approaching your ethics, um, and, and your veganism from either a TD perspective or utilitarian perspective is that, um, ultimately we're all kind of fighting the same fight in terms of, um, trying to avoid, um, outcomes for beings that essentially are um, either, you know, negative or rights violating or suffering causing, um, you know, on the whole. Yeah, I think it's important. It's important to find people that are willing to fight the same fight because we can we can even I would encourage us to even reach out to non vegans as well. There's a lot of um, people who are in favor of like regenerative farming and, and things like this that are going to be very much in favor of ending factory farming. So even if we know we may disagree with them about regenerative farming, um, we can work together to end factory farming and then go from there. Um, I think it's very important to put aside our differences and find a common goal for sure. Yeah. And, and I think also um, when like, you know, kind of like we said, when you, when it comes down to it, um, put it, putting differences aside, um, uh, uh, like besides putting differences aside, I think like we also, it's almost in, in some way coming at, um, a similar problem just from different, from different, um, even, I mean, say, I'm saying like, even if we focus on the differences, I think that, um, the intent behind them is, is good. You know what I mean? In terms of like, um, you know, obviously compare, like, you know, comparison is the robber of joy, but if you, Look at people. Look at humans on a whole. So many humans are um, totally content with being cruel to non-human animals. Have no problem with it. Um, and I think you know, if if let's say we saw um, the, an example of like uh, dog fighting, uh, for example, like you know, you could you could give your explanation as to why you would consider that harmful um, and. And a, and a net bad, and I could give an explanation as to why I think it's harmful and a net bad, and our explanations might be very different. Um, and I mean, yours might have some caveats as pertaining to the amount of pleasure maybe that uh, the humans would derive from it, and mine might have some caveats um, as pertaining to some kind of crazy um, threshold where if I knew that allowing a dog fight to happen, if I had a choice to stop it, would end uh, animal exploitation, you know, thereafter forevermore. Um, I think, you know, I think we would ultimately land on the same side as far as like, whether we would favor that or whether we wouldn't, you know, setters paribus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great. Well, um, one thing, um, kind of like lastly that I wanted to, um, that I want to talk about, and, and I guess I should also just say as a footnote, like, um, like I, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't, know that a, a utilitarian perspective would necessarily be like wrong like I'm, i don't want you to think that i'm positing that it's wrong um in terms of like right and wrong 
Um, it's just different from the way that I would approach things. And, the, and I don't, um, I don't think that it's an example of opposing a wrong thing for the wrong reason. Um, I think it's opposing a wrong thing from a different perspective. Um, that being said, there may be things within your calculus that I would, I would consider, um, eth unethical, um, in terms of like the, the baby pickling thing, like, you know, if you reflect on it and it's your position that, that, that would be ethical. Um, but like, you know, I'm always, um, try, I always try to be aware of the relativity of, of morals, especially, and try to kind of find that separation between ethics and morals. And, um, and I guess like, um, maybe I would encourage you, do, you to do the same in terms of, um, and, and you may be very clear on it already, but like with, with the baby, uh, you know, um, the lady, uh, having intentional pregnancies, uh, for the sole purpose of painlessly aborting six month old fetuses in order to put them in a pickle jar display in her fire in front of her fireplace or whatever, um, for anybody who is just tuning in, um, I guess like I would, I would, um, encourage us both to think about maybe we could we could gain some kind of clarity on our own views um, by doing this exercise whether, whether um, this is something that is um, more uh, in the ethical or more in the moral realm in terms of whether it's desirable or, un or undesirable like I would I would be inclined to think that um, a society I think that morals are based more on like mores you know like the what kind of a society accepts, um, you know, commonplace practices that they kind of accept uh, very, very similar to uh, the, you know, mass breeding and exploitation of non-human animals um, versus like what would, what would be ethical or unethical. Um, and I don't know if, uh, if we could kind of juxtapose the idea of existence between these two concepts and maybe find some clarity on it. Um, I mean, it might just be an ethical impasse uh, where we kind of have to um, kind of just accept that we have a differing view on uh, whether it's ethical or not um, to for the for, you know for this hypothetical lady to to do that, um, but I don't know. Just um, just trying to think of a way that we could kind of um, uh, see more kind of um, where the other person would be coming from. Um, I think um, I think that some something that might be helpful would be to um, if you talk to Carson about this. Um, because I know that um, a topic that I hear him bring up a lot pertains to this um, concept of a future, like a being knowing that they have a future. Um, and uh, and I, I think something that might be beneficial, as I, as I had said before, um, on my end would be to kind of um, really try to intentionally give credence to um, your respect for the um, idea of coming into existence and kind of um and try to try to see that as something um try to i guess see why you value um existence a lot um and and kind of um why the um potential consequence if that was part of the terms of that being existing would be less important to you than the than the pleasure and well-being um that that being would experience uh while they were alive yeah, I think it's really it's really important to have these conversations. Um, and a lot of people don't like hypotheticals, um, but I think hypotheticals are extremely important because it helps test our our uh, intuitions and and our beliefs about morals and ethics and things like this. Um, so yeah, yeah I'll, I'll definitely. It. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'll I'll definitely be reflecting on these different hypotheticals, um, and. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much it'll change my view. Um, I, I think ch changes tends to be a good thing. Um, so I hope it does change it at least somewhat. Um, yeah, and I really yeah. appreciate your willingness to um, to kind of delve into these like difficult questions and and to um, to address them in good faith. And like I think, um, like you said, you know, it's something that like there's a saying in the Bible, you know, that's like a I, I hate to quote the Bible, but something like, um, you know, a man, a man is like a sword, you know, uh, 
it says like a man is sharpened by another or something like that, you know, just in, 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 in the sense, um, as we discuss these things, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is just the idea that as we um, discuss these topics, and as you said, our hypotheticals, it kind of brings us closer to um, an understanding of uh, what our what our beliefs are at their core. Um, and I think I think it's really important to know what our beliefs are, because, um, you know, I think, uh, I think to quote Melanie Joy, I believe she, she said this, like, without awareness, there's no free choice. Um, and I think that um, if we're aware of what our beliefs are, then we know what informs our, our choices. And if we know what informs our choices, we can be better um, mediators, I guess, uh, between thought and action. Um, so I think I think it is really important to um, have uh, time when we when we kind of step back and kind of reflect on uh, what our beliefs are. Um, and I guess uh, the last thing um, that I kind of wanted to get at was um, just this idea of like uh, the foot in the door technique when it comes to outreaching. Um, I know you alluded to um, talking to non-vegans a, a moment ago, so I just wanted to kind of touch on that for a little bit. Um, I know this this discussion has been a lot more kind of like meta ethical, but um, I think it would be really good if we could just spend a few minutes just talking about um, uh, outreach with non-vegans. And I guess, um, like, I, I think um, from what I understand uh, from your conversation with Carson, like, you would be a fan of reducitarian kind of measures. Like, um, I don't know if it was him or, or Vegan Gains. I think it was Vegan Gains who kind of uh, coined the term like slaveless Tuesdays. Um, and I guess, like, I guess what I would kind of just encourage um, – like I understand that if if it's a given that um, people are let's say uh, slaves are going to be beat, let's just think of an example like slaves are going to be beaten seven days a week um, if if one day they're not beaten uh, then they receive less beatings you know if if it is otherwise a given that they would have received uh, x number of beatings let's say seven beatings and they receive six um, I just it kind of I kind of cringe at the notion that slaveless Tuesdays would be great for slaves. Like, um, I think like, uh, it, that's pretty, um, that, you know, to think that way seems kind of insensitive to me. Um, and it seems very like, uh, master post-centric. <laughs> I just made up a word there, but, um, I think one thing that maybe, um, if we're to kind of bring this back to a real world, um, uh, allegory is like the, um, the treatment of non-human animals in um, in these in factory farm settings and the like um, can be something that we can actually borrow from. Like we can utilize what's happening to those animals and turn it into a foot in the door or incremental win that is more utility producing than uh, simply. Um, reducing your uh, participation in those things, reducing someone's participation in those things. Um, and let, let me, uh, I guess, explain, like, um, if somebody makes a connection with the fact that, let's say, um, cows need to be impregnated in order to produce milk, um, they, if, if we can get a small win and just have somebody say that they believe it's wrong to, to do so on principle, um, I think that that can have an effect where um, they maybe stop uh, buying um, cow lactations and you know the products that are made with them, cheese, yogurt, etc. Um, on the whole, um, and I think that the potential of that to have um, an, an effect where it kind of leads them toward a vegan path is greater than. Um, having somebody just, let's say, if they, if they just say, oh, um, I think like, you know, it, it's, this is all kind of okay, but I'm just going to do less of it, like for my health or for the environment or something like that. Like, I think if we're able to get our foot in the door on ethical grounds to a slight degree, I think that that has more of a potential to blossom into a person, um, taking ethical issue, whether, whether it's from utilitarian or deontological or whatever perspective, I think, I think if that seed that we plant or if that foot that we get in the door is from that perspective, um, that, that has the potential to spread to other, um, analogous kind of behaviors in which that person's engaged. Um, 
but I'm, I mean, I'm also I'm also willing to see the perspective of um, um, uh, reduction, also kind of um, maybe changing that person in, in a sense where um, if if somebody goes on a plant based diet, they may um, they may be less inclined to define or to defend rather the um, the practices that are involved in exploiting animals. So. I mean, I'll I'll never advocate. I'm pretty sure from a reducitarian perspective, but I can definitely see how if a person just wakes up one morning, and they're like, "Hey, wow, I've been reducing my animal uh, flesh and secretion consumption for so long. Um, why would I even bother to uh, stand up for these things happening anymore?" You know, if I like, I guess if a person is not participating in those things, they um, have a lot less cognitive dissonance. If the if it then dawns upon them and it occurs to them that they should maybe adopt a position that those things ought not continue or that they ought not participate in them, rather than just like I guess it's the is ought paradigm. And I I, I can see I can see a point where somebody goes from is to ought, and I can see them having been brought to the is through having reduced. Um, but I just see I see it as um, potentially more beneficial at the outset to plant a small ought and see if that um, leads to more oughts throughout that person's life. And, and I, I think that they might be able to have potentially a greater social impact also if they're um, inoculated, so to speak, with with some small oughts. But I don't know, I, I rambled a little bit. Uh, hey, uh, Carson's here, by the way, uh, good to see you. And um, I'm wondering if, uh, Jerome, if you have any thoughts on that. I know it's a little bit rambly, but hopefully that made sense. Yeah, I think I think the two approaches tend to work together. Um, I, I can give you an example from my personal life. So before I was vegan, I was very much not vegan. Um, I ate a ton of animal products. Um, I was I was actually working at Chick Fil A. Wow. Um, but my roommate went vegetarian, and so kind of consequentially, our, a lot of our groceries became vegetarian. Um, and that's when I sort of started to realize that, Hey, a bean burrito isn't that much worse than the beef burrito is. Um, and, and while my, my conversion to veganism was pretty much cold Turkey, it mostly came from an Alex O'Connor speech and, um, animal liberation. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if the, the sort of reductionary, like eating bean burritos instead of beef burritos in my apartment um, made it easier for that cold turkey sort of switch to happen. So when I was, when I eventually heard this Alex O'Connor speech, um, I was more open to, um, I was more open to sort of like this foot in the door approach, if that makes sense. So if I understand correctly, you're, you're saying that you're skeptical as to the notion of whether reducing led you to be psychologically kind of more primed or open to receiving that message from that speech. Um, yeah, well, see, I'm, yeah, I'm saying that like this, um, reductionary ap approach that, um, sort of happened with me made me, made me more open to, um, the, the, uh, yeah, made, made me more open to the speech. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I missed the beginning of that. So, um, you you are not skeptical as to that, or you are sorry. No, I'm I'm not skeptical. I I, th oh, okay. I think I gotcha. think um it's it's um the uh, reductionary approach incur and made it easier for me to accept the speech when I heard it. Gotcha. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think I think um, cognitive distance has a lot to do with that, and um, you know, it's like you know I don't know if you're familiar with this idea, but it's like you know what you're presented with. You're presented with some kind of um, new idea or behavior is proposed to you to adopt, and then you kind of um, judge that based on you know you appraise it and you say, "What are my pre-existing beliefs? Is this in conflict with my pre-existing beliefs?" Um, similarly, to like you know, if you if you're on the street and you offer somebody dog meat in the U.S., they're going to appraise that in terms of their existing beliefs, and they somewhat um, in the background know that if they eat that then they're going to have this painful experience afterwards. Um, some might call it guilt. 
Um, but really, I would say it's more just dissonance because it would it would fly in the face of their pre-existing kind of beliefs, notions um, that they've built up. So there'd be this dissonance. Um, of course, the other thing that they could do is they could say like, um, fine, you know, I guess it's a slaughtered animal very much like a cow or a pig. And uh, the processes involved are more or less uh, analogous and similar and um, and that and they have no problem. Um, and, you know, that's always the danger with with um, talking to people about their cognitive dissonance, because you can and I, I've I've seen it pretty much happen where you push somebody off their off their uh, species position uh, a little bit to the point where they um, or I should say speciesistic, because I think um, I think we're all kind of species to some extent, but um, you kind of push them to broaden their circle of exploitation or kind of broaden what they're okay with almost for the sake of consistency, um, almost to avoid that, that dissonance. So um, it, it can, it can be a little bit dicey when you, when you get into philosophical conversations with people where um, you're confronting their speciesism, you kind of always run the risk of, of them going kind of like uh, kind of full madman in a way and, and being like, Hmm, why do I select selectively discriminate? Why, why am I selectively cruel? You know, uh, it's, it's always something that, um, when, when you're, when you're coming face to face with cognitive dissonance, that can be an unintended consequence. And I think that might be part of the reason why I strive to adopt more of a, um, deontological approach because, um, I don't, I don't want to ever encourage people to kind of like, um, to, to go the route of uh, consistency and um, and like uh, accept the entailments of uh, mitigating their their cognitive dissonance if such entailments involve um, doing horrible things. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely see the value in um in your approach for sure. Um, I really appreciate I, that. And yeah, and, and I see, I see the value in yours as well. Um, I think that um, you would probably be faster to answer like ethical conundrum related questions than I would. I'd probably need more time to, to think about certain hypotheticals. Whereas I think with your approach, you save um, a con probably a considerable amount of mental and emotional resources just being able to apply a um almost like a rule in a way it almost it almost sounds like like this is the thing when I, like when i when i think about the the mental um disposition so to speak of a person uh who has a utilitarian mindset i tend to think very much in terms of okay these are the rules that they would adopt because it's almost like you know it's hard for me as a person who subscribes to a deontological perspective to, to place myself in that, in that mental, um, framework, so to speak, because it's like, I, I always want to kind of have the same parameters, boundaries and, um, conventions, so to speak, that I, that I'm used to, and then kind of view it in light of those. Um, so it's difficult for me to think about being a utilitarian without being like, okay, these are the rules that I would follow in order to be a utilitarian. Cause it's almost like, um, my concept is based on a definition that is essentially, you know, definition is essentially a, a type of, um, constraint. It's like rules, you know, about what a concept is. Yeah, no, it's, it's like you have your, your perspective and then, and then even looking at other people's perspectives is kind of under the, the, uh, translation of your perspective. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. But, um, I think um, we should probably end up um, kind of wrapping this up here, but um, this was so much fun and like really kind of mind, uh, you know, bending in a way where um, I, I really um, got to kind of see um, your perspectives on a lot of different things and um, and kind of juxtaposing those against my perspectives. And I hope that you found some value in it also. Yeah, absolutely. It was a good chat. And um, is there anything, Jerome, that you'd want to kind of um, to say or like, you know, even in terms of like stuff um, on your channel, things like that, that you'd want people to uh, kind of be on the lookout for or kind of 
um, anything like that. I know I, I checked out your music. You have some pretty awesome music. I, I was like, man, like I, I, I kind of wish that I had like become a fan of this guy's music before getting to chat with him. So I could like be more kind of like starstruck here, but um, I would encourage everybody to check out Jerome's music. He has some pretty, pretty you have an amazing voice and, and some pretty creative music. Um, and I, I'm kind of a musical snob, so I don't know. Uh, I, I think that an endorsement from, from Haas Vegan should, shouldn't be taken lightly as, as it pertains to music. Um, but yeah, if there's anything else you want to share in terms of like your channel or anything like that, any projects or anything, um, it'd be great to hear. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I'm, I'm, so I'm always working on music, so I'm always posting music to my channel. Um, I have a couple different chats coming up. Um, the most recent one is with Reasonable Vegan um, Monday. Um, we're talking about the, um, the definition of veganism. Um, he, he has a, a rough draft he's been working on as far as a, a new definition, which I think is really interesting. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I have a chat coming up with uh, I will have to work out the details, but I have a chat coming up with Benny Malone um, about bivalve sentience and other things. Um, but yeah, I say uh, subscribe to House Vegan, sus subscribe to my channel, and yeah, that's it. Awesome. Well, again, um, I appreciate your coming on again. And um, I know we had a little bit of a crazy start with me forgetting what time um, we had scheduled for, but I appreciate your flexibility on it. And um, I appreciate everybody watching, whether you watch live or um, sometime in the future. And um, Jerome, I'd also encourage you, you have my email. So if you can think of anything, whether um, it's related to the pickled babies or anything else, um, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out at all. Um, and I hope everybody has a really beautiful Saturday. And um, thanks again, Jerome, for being here. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your weekend.